Hey guys, welcome back to another episode with Melinda and myself. This is episode four, I believe, and soon I'm gonna lose track of what number we're on. Melinda, what are we gonna talk about today? I wanna know how can I charge $18,000 for a logo? And I'm not getting paid that. What are you getting paid? 5,000 or less. Okay, and how do you feel about that? Angry. Uh, angry at who? Are you angry at me? <laughs> are you angry at me saying that? I get angry at people who are charging more and because I don't know how to do it. Okay, so let's talk about that today. We're gonna do a deeper dive on how to charge more, basically doing the same amount of work. Stick around. All right, we're back. You wanted to learn how to charge more for a logo. Yes. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. What, what are your questions? So in one of your videos, you mentioned that you charge $18,000 for a logo, or you yes. have in the past. Yes. And I see that as absolutely. And do you, do you realize the $18,000, it was a point in time. Now it's much, much higher okay. than that. Yes. Which okay, is, so we'll see. Okay. So now it's gonna make this conversation even more interesting, right? Right. All right, so I know that you're angry. <laughs> So I have no, I have no idea how to even get there. Like it's almost, it's laughable to me. Okay. It's laughable? It's laughable. Why don't you laugh then? Because I'm slightly angry. <laughs> about it. Do you I, have, do you have an angry laugh? No. Like if your husband said something that was an off color joke, what's your angry I'm laugh? I'm silent. Oh, okay. I go silent. Right. So. Okay. So here we go. Yeah. Who told you that you should charge $5,000 for a logo? And why do you believe that to be your ceiling? Because of competitive research I've done. Competitive research, that sounds so scientific. Tell uh, me about your competitive research. So asking around other designers who I feel are maybe equal in skill level or experience to myself so that I relate to them okay. and asking them how much they charge or checking up on their prices. They post their prices on their site? Some do, not all. <clears throat> okay, how many friends did you ask? It's been an ongoing, like it's an ongoing thing that I'm aware of, so I don't have a particular number. Is it more than a dozen? Is it less than a dozen? Is it more than a hundred? Between, no, it's about 10. Let's just say 10. <laughs> so guys, get this. Melinda's competitive research is asked a bunch of her friends, and a bunch by being 10, that's competitive research? That's like you just asked 10 people. You put such a fancy title Ten, well, on it. Well, it's, it's the people that I filtered out that I wouldn't say I compete with, whether it be experience or skill level. Okay. Or even our target market in general. So it's me filtering down to get those 10 people. Okay, we got a lot to talk about in this episode. This is gonna get really juicy because I know a lot of people out there saw that video and were really excited about it. And there's this tiny percentage, I would say like 5% that were really angry about it, saying, I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm a fool, this is robbery, it's dishonest, and uneth unethical to charge more for the same work. Hmm. Let's talk about that. I also want to challenge your assumption that people are at different levels of logo design. What's your favorite logo? What's my favorite like the logo? The really beautifully designed logo. Currently, the UPS logo. The, the new UPS logo? No. The old the one. Old UPS logo. The one that was designed by Paul Rand. So you look at that logo, and from a technical point of view, let me ask you this question. Do you have the skills, the faculty, to design that logo? Could you redraw that logo? I can redraw that logo. Okay. So technically, there's no difference between the logo that you drew and the one that Paul Rand drew. Just because you can trace something doesn't mean that you can come up with that yeah, idea. Yeah, but let, let me just say this. If I see an amazing painting from, like, say, James Jean, mm -hmm. I don't sit there and look at it and say, I can paint that thing, because I cannot. Or if I look at a Caravaggio or a Rembrandt painting, I do not sit around saying, I can paint that thing. So therefore, the hand skills of the artist who made that are far superior to my hand skills. If you're speaking of just hand skills. Then right, okay. like I couldn't okay. even pretend to trace it. Right. Okay, so this conversation, I'm gonna be pushing you and you can push me. I'm gonna challenge all of your assumptions because I'm not sure that they're true. Right. Now I see your lip, like you're like quivering over there. Are you really angry? Okay. All right, so technically you could draw the Nike logo, the Apple logo, the new Verizon logo. You have the skills to do that. So what separates you from the person who created that? What do you think? Because I'm telling you right now, they got paid a lot more money to do that logo than you. 
Right. Why? Why do you think that to be true? Why can they charge more than you? If technically you can draw the exact same logo. I'm sure they're firebombing me on the comments right now, but that's okay. Well, for some of these designers, they're well known. So they've okay. built up the reputation okay. to being known for that. Okay. What's your so reputation? So I think it's my reputation. I'm yeah. not that known. Right okay. Now. All right. So I think it's, it's the things behind the logo. So it's not just the physical <clears throat> logo. It's the, I think the, the logo comes with so much more. What does it come with? Well, it comes with reputation of the designer. What else? It comes with the concept or the strategy in getting to that idea and how well it represents the company and communicates the intended message. Uh -huh. uh, talking to the target market, is it actually designed for the intended target market and attracts those people? Okay. Uh, can it go, is it memorable? Is it scalable? All of the principles of uh, Good logo design, yeah. yeah, which we, you know, you learned, right? Right. Okay, what else? That's all I got right now. All right, let's, let's tackle each and every one of these one at a time. Okay. Can you see strategy? Can I see strategy? Yeah. Can, do you know what the strategy is behind the UPS logo? I see the end result that would inform The answer is no. <laughs> you cannot see strategy. Okay. The, the form that was given to this thing is ultimately what shapes, like it, we're, we're talking about shapes that are created, but you can't see strategy. You don't know what they talked about. You don't know what kind of things they're trying to accomplish. All you see is the final thing, and you can try to reverse engineer in your mind what that strategy is. You can't see strategy, right? Last time I checked, you cannot see strategy. <clears throat> okay. Can you see target market? No. no. If we're using the same Yeah, same arguments. criteria. Okay. You no, can't see target, can't market. See like, target market. I'll ask you right now. Who's the target market for the UPS logo? And is that reflected in the market itself? No. No. Mm. Wow. Okay. So you gave you gave me like five things and I've already knocked off two of the five. Okay. Is the UPS logo memorable and scalable? Yes. And those are technical things. Mm -hmm. Right? It's distinctive. And it's using thick enough lines and it doesn't have crazy detail to it. So it can be scaled to a half inch square. It can be scaled up to the size of a building and it still works in both formats. And those are things that you learn in design school. So as long as you practice good design fundamentals, chances are you will arrive at a market that's memorable and scalable. So the one thing that's left, no, there's two things left, I'm sorry, is your reputation and the concept. Let's talk about your reputation. All right, so people are buying your reputation. Let's deconstruct that, your rep reputation. What is reputation to you? Reputation is how people, well, my actions that I've done and how people perceive them. So building up, as, do people see me as having integrity and integrity in my design? Okay, how do they know that you have integrity? That I have proven, not proven, but past design that I've done, so case okay. studies are Okay, so now, now we work. can see that, right? You can see case studies. Uh -huh. You can see a uh, body of work. Clients that I've worked with. Previous clients. Maybe how long I've been okay. doing design. Yeah. What do you call that? How do, what do you call how long you've been doing something? Experience or um, history? History. History, okay. So you tend to trust people who have been doing something for longer. That's mm -hmm. natural, okay. Like you've put in your 10,000 hours mm -hmm. towards mastery, which you may or may not be at this point, but that's okay. What else? Well, that's all I'm, that's coming to me right now. Maybe, maybe how the work is presented. Yes. Okay, so yes. that's part of the case studies, right? All right. Uh, part of your reputation gets into your notoriety. Mm-hmm. Meaning, have I read books about you? Have you won a lot of awards? Okay, so how much press that you have? Would you say reviews as well? What is reviews? Reviews could be... Testimonials? Testimonials. Okay. Some people are on Yelp or getting, you know, just sure. reviews like that um, reviewed in any editorial work that people are talking about your company or your work. Okay, all right. Let's look at the things that you can actually impact today. So now what we realize is the logo can and is technically the exact same thing. And putting aside for one minute 
these best practices in terms of logo design, like making it memorable, scalable, does it read in one color, is there a strong idea behind it, does it solve a functional problem for the company, okay? Let's see, and it passes all that. That's in a different category. Now let's look at what we've called broadly reputation. Do you have great case studies of your work? Not currently. Okay. You're going to take notes? Yes. All right. <laughs> case studies. And do you have a large body of work? I don't have a large body How of many? work. How many? I have, do you have, currently I have 10. 10? Okay, write that number down, 10. Do you talk and share who your previous clients were or are? I've shared some, yes. Yeah, okay. especially in the Is work. Is that clear? So we've worked with probably over 100 clients. And they're all Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies. Are you there? No. Okay, so we need to work on that. Okay. And how long has Marks & Maker been in business? A year and a half. That's not a long time. Okay, but everybody's got to start somewhere a year and a half. That history you can't really change. Right. But you can buy history and I'll t talk about that later. Okay, how is your work presented? Does it feel as if it were worth $18,000 or does it feel like it's worth $5,000? Feels like it's worth 5000 Okay, you know how to fix that, right? Yes, Designers are the best people to make something look a lot more expensive than it really is, period. Use those skills, use your training and make it look great. There is no excuse for you not to make your work look like it's a million dollars. The only excuse is, I'm lazy, I don't care. And guess what? If you don't care, I don't care. I would like to add challenge? something. Yes. I challenge me. Because I think it is difficult for a designer, it's difficult for a designer to design for themselves or even see where they're currently at. Like it's easy to be objective about another company and design for them and see, oh, you're, you know, you look like you only should be charging $10, but you're wanting to charge 100 because you don't look a part of that. So it, right. I think it's a lot easier to do that for other people, but perception and seeing ourselves and where we're at, sometimes we have blinders on and it's really difficult to be objective with our own stuff. You think so? Yes, out of experience. Right. It's, it's now you're difficult. gonna push me, I'm gonna push you right back. Okay. And I love it. And I encourage you to push back as much as possible because I think people who are watching this episode are thinking what you're thinking, but they can't talk to me. And so if you do that, even if you don't wholly feel it, if you feel something, just articulate it. Do you like nice clothes? Yeah. How do you know what to wear? How do I know what to wear? Yeah, how do you know how to go out and buy a new outfit, like uh, the shirt that you're wearing or an accessory? How do you know what to buy and what to wear? It's an interesting question. I, I know how I do it. How do you do it? I look through magazines. Oh, okay. Like, I inform myself of what people who are in the know in fashion, what they do. So I might look through GQ, I might look through Esquire or one of these magazines and I'll find things that I like. And then I look at it and I'm like, wow, that is really expensive. That's a Dolce & Gabbana shirt and that's a pair of Prada shoes. I don't feel like I want to spend that much money buying those things. But I want to look like that. So I say, so what is it about those things that make it look really good? And I make mental inventory. Or maybe there's a unique color combination that I haven't thought of before. So the next time I go out and I'm out shopping at something that's more within my price range, what I feel comfortable with, okay? Like say I go to Club Monaco and I walk in there, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I think if I do this, this, and I can make that work. And you know, in a lot of the editorial spreads, they have the, the fancy, super expensive look. And they have one where a informed shopper is able to recreate the look for one-tenth of the price. They do this for interior design. They do this for fashion. And so that's how I do it. Now, you're sitting there thinking, okay, something as subjective and as personal about who you are and your statement as the clothes that you wear, you're able to do it. I look for consistency in thinking. And I think most people say they can't do it because it's an excuse. You could literally do the same thing. You go onto Behance, you go onto these websites where people are charging a boatload of money for the work that they produce. You can look at how they present their work and you could screen capture the whole thing. Then you go back in and you recreate those things in your own way. What's stopping you from doing that? You don't even have to be subjective or objective about this. You're like, I like that, emulate that. I like this, emulate this. 
They showed a phone with a hand in it, this beautiful hand model. You grab your phone, you get a friend who has a beautiful hand, you photograph that, or you buy it from stock. So what's stopping you now? I guess there is a block sometimes with wanting to present myself as someone else. I see that I should be doing it and I see the value mm -hmm. in that. What I have sometimes that stops me is that I want to express myself or it come from me instead of me getting the inspiration from someone else. Okay, and we've talked about this before. Right. Aren't you the sum of all your life experiences? Okay, expand on that. Well, how do you know how to think? What are, your, are these your thoughts or thoughts you've read? Are you taught by some influential mentor? How, how do you know to use Futura or Bodoni? Did you draw those typefaces? So again, I think one of the biggest roadblocks in people in our space, in the creative community, is this concept, and it's a false one at that, about being original. So Paul Rand said, don't try to be original, just try to be good. So I've seen this done time and time again. This is a two decade old conversation and a debate I would get in with my classmates from school. They're busy doing stupid things because they think it's original and it's ugly and it's dumb. Where are they today? I don't know. It reminds me of Doyle Young. He said, I don't want to be different. I just want to be better. That would be fine. All right. All right. So you're sitting there worrying about, oh, I got to do it my own way. And you're just fooling yourself because it's really not your own way. What else? So we were talking about the rep we're still going on reputation though. So yeah. Well, no, no, we're talking about these beautiful case studies that you seemingly can't do because your work doesn't look like their work. We're going to encounter this a lot in our conversations. Everybody is getting in their own way of success, about doing great work, about achieving whatever personal goals they have, professional goals, and a lot of this is just mindset. So who taught you all these ideas about trying to do this this way? Who taught you this? I, pr I picked it up from my life from who? experiences. From School? Who? No, I mean like this idea that you should try and go make your own case study totally different than everybody else that's in this space doing this exact same thing. I feel like it's something that we pick up on, I pick up on social media or just wanting to be different just in general, like looking at everyone else's stuff that, I don't know, it's something about wanting to stand out, wanting to be different. Okay, amongst. well that's odd. I'm looking at you right now. You don't have purple hair and mohawk. You look like everybody else that's kind of like you. And that doesn't offend you, does it? No. Right? So why, why you, you kind of see like for me, like the logic just doesn't carry through. You didn't build your own laptop. You bought one that everybody in our space buys. You bought an Apple laptop. And if you go to San Francisco and you go in the design community, everybody looks exactly the same. So where is this desire to be so different coming from? And would you rather be good? Would you rather get paid $18,000? Or would you rather just be different and unique? I'd rather get paid $18,000. Me too. <laughs> what people don't understand is this, is that clients do not hire the best and most unique option. They buy the least risky option. And guess what? When there's a bunch of zebras running around and you're an antelope, you look pretty risky to me. I'd rather just get the zebra. You need to understand that, okay? Familiarity with something says it's safe. So there's a reason why all the big corporate ID companies that charge hundreds of thousands of dollars, why they present their work in a certain way. They seem very buttoned up. They have a very well-documented process. They have a large roster of clients and they talk about terms that maybe designers that are working at the $500 or the $5,000 mark just don't talk about at all. They want to be seen as thought leaders. They're influential. They maybe have written a couple of books on the subject. And we talked about the law of attraction before, that like attracts like. If you want to attract the clients that are paying $18,000 and up, you need to be like the companies that they're attracted to. But we're too busy being unique. We're too busy being original. We're too busy being different. If that works for you, Godspeed.
and I like less competition, so that's great for me. Okay? So you can't change history, but we said you can influence. How do you change history? You've been in business for a year and a half. Okay? If you brought on a partner that has 15 years of experience, now you've purchased history. There is a way to do that. So that's Even how companies if the company do it. It doesn't matter. It's the history of the people, not the brand. You need to understand that. So then would my design history, as far as how long I've been working, count as my history? You can get creative. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. You can get creative. Some people say, uh, we have a combined experience of 176 years. Of course it's not true, but he's got 25 years, she's got 30 years, she's got 40 years, and our collective combined experience equals that. You can get creative, okay? It's not about when you trademarked the name or when you filed your business permit. That's not really what it's about. Now, luckily for me, we have been in business for 22 years, so I can say that, and that's okay, all right? So let's talk about the other things that you need to do. You need to be known, and there's lots of ways to be known. Traditional media and new media, let's talk about traditional media first. When you're in magazines and books, that's traditional media people tend to give that a little bit more weight and gravity because it's real, it's tangible. Some authors spend the time to curate, award, and then print a book out. That's cool. There's new media, which is like appearing on blogs and sites that have large followings. And I say, do it all. Be everywhere. Go ahead and submit some of your work for some awards so that that means something to somebody. It doesn't mean much to me personally, but it does mean something to some of our clients when you say, I've won this and I've done that. Because again, familiarity about being the least risky option is the clients see that, wow, other people are also saying that you're good. Not just you, other people and people that I trust. You've won that award. You've won the Clio. You've won whatever the print design awards are. You've been featured in How Magazine 10 times now. You were on the cover. Okay? And so you want to make sure that press that you're getting is on your site. Do you have any press right now, either new or traditional? Besides this? <laughs> I hope this doesn't count as your press strategy, no. but no. Um, awards, a few awards, yes. A few awards? Yeah. Is it displayed on your site? Is it no. talked about? Why not? It was something that I got awarded for when I was a student or coming right out of college. Okay, that so doesn't count. Work. Yeah. So let's do some professional work. Okay. Go ahead and submit to a few of those things. Get your work known. There's this fallacy, this kind of strange concept, and I'm guilty of this myself, that I thought, because I'm good, people should be able to come and find me. It's much easier to go to the client than to expect the client to come to you. It is possible, but your social game has to be on point. Your SEO game has to be on point. And chances are, if you're not spending all your time working on that and you don't know what you're doing, it's not on point. Okay, are we clear about this so far? Yes. So the only thing that separates you from companies that get $18,000 and up, you can add a zero to that if you want, is things we talked about. What about, can you talk about presentation? Yeah, what about it? How, How are you How that influences the price. Yeah, we've talked about this in our last episode in terms of all the things that surround the work create an impression if you're credible, if you're valuable, and if you're worth the money that I'm going to spend, period. So if you have a jank site, it doesn't have a lot of copy, doesn't document your process, doesn't speak in an intelligent way, then I put you in a different category, okay? So. The, the beauty of designers is we know how to present work, don't we, visually? Hire a copywriter, help them, have them help shape the messaging. Build it around a philosophy or approach. What else? Testimonials and reviews. Yeah, I think testimonials and reviews are a little bit less important, but they're, testimonials are great if it's from a big name. Mama's Bake Shop saying you're the best designer in the world actually hurts you. What about... And I Yelp did, reviews, I'm not sure. I did get a testimonial that specifically said because of the work we've done together, they've gotten into major accounts and retailers because that that's shows... Cool. The effectiveness, the effectiveness of your design. Yeah. So something like that yeah, would be... That, that's great. Not like, she does awesome work. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Well, if you're about effectiveness of work, then you should build a process that communicates that. That becomes your differentiator. We don't just make pretty marks. We do work that gets results. And here's how we do that. And you can talk about that. Okay? Anything else? No, that. Okay, so I won you over pretty easily then. I don't think our audience is convinced. So let's uh, see if you can inhabit their mind for a little bit and see if you can come back and fire away. But Chris, but Chris, but Chris, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. The people who are offended, the people who are angry right now at me for saying these things, channel them, channel their energy. So all this makes sense right now. It, it makes sense as you're going through everything. Now when I go home and I'm <laughs> actually in the middle of this and doing everything, like implementing all of these new things, the, it takes a lot of time. So I see the distance from me being at 5,000 to an $18,000 logo. There's a big gap of time and Let's work that. that's in the middle okay. that gets very overwhelming. All right. And so this all does, it totally, I get it. And I agree with you. But getting there, there's a lot. Okay, I forgot. There's more for us to talk about here. And whether you're designing a logo, if you're a cinematographer and you're shooting a wedding video, or you're making a website for somebody, these principles will apply, okay? Are you worth more than you're charging right now? Do you feel how like you I are? How do I know that? I don't know. Okay, uh, how do you, how did you determine the 5,000 again? Because of my competitive research. Uh, no offense to any of your friends. You just asked a bunch of fools and you went with what the <laughs> fools do, right? If you had asked me, I would have told you it's worth this amount. Right. Right? Right. Okay. But what about, okay. So are you more comfortable listening to a bunch of your friends or listening to somebody who's doing it, who's trying to teach people how to do it? Let's switch into role play mode. Okay. Okay. I want you to tell me how much you're going to charge me to do a logo. This is just you and I'm a client. Okay. Uh, I like your work. I saw you on this dumb channel on YouTube and I looked you up and I like the work. It's very classy. How much would you charge to design a logo for me? What's your company? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, typically we charge between 18 and 20,000 for a logo. 18 to 20? Yes. Um, what's the difference between an 18 and 20,000 dollar logo? Backtrack. Rewind. Scratch. Rewind. Okay, rewind. What would you charge me to do a logo? I charge 18,000. How does that sound to you? Oh, that's a lot of money. Wow. Woo, that's a lot more than this other person I know that charges $5,000. What's the difference between what you do and what they do? Well, we have been in business for 10 years. You have not. <laughs> you, I looked at your site, Marks and Manger, founded in nine, you know, 2015. Well, we, this is after I've updated it, right? Or this is currently? Well, what are we doing currently? Whatever. Okay. Yeah, let's just base on reality right now. Okay. Well, I've worked with many clients that we have hit their business goals of getting in them into major retailers and accounts. And so our work goes beyond just pretty marks, but actually achieving your business goals. I, but I just see pretty marks. And I just want a pretty mark. I don't need you to help me with my business goals. Okay, well, if that's what you're looking for, then that $5,000 designer sounds perfect for your needs. Oh, okay, thanks a lot. Okay, how, how do you feel about this? Would you be able to say this? Without laughing, no. Well, yeah, for sure you don't want to laugh when somebody's asking you about your price. Right. Okay, I want to teach you a couple of concepts, okay? Let's, let's get into breaking this thing down. The first thing I'm going to tell you to do is don't go from five to 18. You're not ready. Right. So the first thing I want you to do is just double your rate. Simply just double your rate. It's a very simple formula. So instead of saying 18 or 16 to 18, just say it from five to $10,000. Okay, then when the question is asked, what's the difference between a five and $10,000 logo? Yes, it says it depends on your needs, how complicated the assignment is. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're gonna do this and they're gonna, you're gonna get pushed back. And the first objection you're gonna hear is it's too much money, okay? then you need to say that it is too much money. You don't go on the defensive right away. The whole concept behind embrace and pivot is you must first embrace because it sounds like you're getting defensive, like you're trying to prove your value, which I don't want to do. Okay. Let's rewind the tape. I will be you now. 
it's much easier for me to be you, I think. Okay. And I've only been in business for a year and a half, so you can't pull that out. Okay. All right, so let's go. So, go ahead, you start it off. Hey, I would love to hire you for a logo. That's great, I would love to work with you. What do you need? Um, I need a logo for my new business that I'm starting. How much do you charge? I charge somewhere between five to $10,000. Does that fit within the budget of what you're prepared to spend? No, it's uh, actually beyond what I thought logo design was. What were you thinking? I only have, you know, $1,400 for $1, something $1,400? Like wow, Melinda, that is not something that I can do. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that can do that. You're probably better off working with one of those people. And I do, I do appreciate you considering us, but the clients that I work with, it's got to be somewhere between five to ten. Would you like me to refer you to some people? Sure. Okay, great. Have a great day. Let's try that again. You want to give me a different reaction this time? Yeah. Okay. It's between five to $10,000. Is that something you're prepared to spend? No, that's ridiculous. It is? Yeah, that's way too much money. What do you want to spend? Not that. Like what? That just doesn't seem worth it. What's, what's making it worth five to 10,000? Oh, 000? I see. Let me ask you a question. What kind of car did you drive over uh, to this meeting? A Dodge Charger. No, you didn't. <laughs> a Toyota Prius. No, you didn't. <laughs> what? You drove a BMW something something. Okay. Okay. What, what kind of car did you drive over here? A BMW. BMW 5 Series? Yeah. Okay. Well, all cars can get you from point A to B. Why did you pick the BMW? Because of how it drove, it's comfortable. It's a driver's car. It's yeah. German, precision engineering. The way the door sounds when you close it versus uh, some kind of import, versus uh, a domestic make. The styling is incredible, right? And you pay for that because do you know that when you buy the car, you're only not just buying the car, but you're joining a tribe of people who identify themselves as BMW owners. It's also called the ultimate driving machine. So it says to me, you care about design and details, but now I'm hearing something very different about your own brand. So when people look at your own brand, they might walk away feeling like now you're the Dodge Caravan. Is that the, the thing that you want to put out there? And that's totally up to you. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't seem to be consistent with the way you work. You spent probably $65,000, $70,000 on that car, am I right? Mm -hmm. So you want to spend $1,500 on the logo? See, so people, I understand this, want to be consistent in their lives. We, we strive to be consistent in everything that we do. Does it sound consistent to you? No, not when you phrase it like that, but I okay. still only have okay. $1,500. Fine, go save some money. Come back to me when you're ready, because we're not ready to work together. I put too much energy and effort. I've, I've done too much training in my life and it just wouldn't be right. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the door. Thank you very much. You want to do this again? How many times do you want to do this until I get to yes? Do it one more time. One more time? We'll be, this will be the yes. Take three. <laughs> Take three. This is more, you're open. You don't have to say yes. Okay. Just you're more open. Okay. The logo is going to cost somewhere between five to $10,000. Is that what you have to spend? Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't put down a budget yet, so I really don't know what to expect. Great. So what do I get for five to 10000 Well, let's sit down and look at what your needs are. What are you trying to do with this logo? Why, why do you feel compelled to design a new logo for your company? Because I want to be recognized by okay. my audience. I want to attract a certain type of person, too. Mm -hmm. And I would really like to get my product into major retailers. What kind of product, product is it? Jewelry. You're in the jewelry business? Mm -hmm. Oh, so packaging is very important to you. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. it's about the feeling. The case has to be a certain way. Like when I buy jewelry or um, a watch or something, or even perfume, it's all about the packaging. The packaging says to me it's valuable. Have you ever noticed like when, when you're at the airport and you go through the duty-free section and there's like the Remy Martins and all the kind of different brands, XO? You notice how like elaborately they're packaged? because they're asking for a lot of money for that bottle. And we have a whole experience. It's this idea of ceremony. When you touch the box and you pull it out of the velvet bag and there's like a little golden rope and you take it out. And the, the bottle itself looks like a piece of jewelry. 
It's hand-blown crystal and the label, and there's a story and a history to that. I help create those kind of experiences. Is that something that you'd like to do? Yes. Great. Definitely. It's $8,000 then. All right. Well, I'll work it into my budget. Let's do this. It's a pleasure. All right. So we just ran through three different scenarios. I want to ask you a few questions. I'm going to break it down for people what I'm doing. And maybe that's what you need to be asking me as well. Yeah. It's very easy for me to say. It really is because I've had lots of practice and I teach people how to do this. But you're sitting there like, yeah, it was nice to watch you do it. And then I go home like blah, blah, blah. And it's not going to come out right. Yeah. So first, I want to take your temperature. Take one, take two, take three. As the client, how did you feel each time? Shocked at, Shocked. at price. Uh, I came in the third time. I came in not really knowing what to expect. So ready like open and ready to hear whatever, you know, okay. comes my way. So I want to suggest that you guys do something right now. If you don't want $1,500 logo clients to come in the door, make your site look like a $1,500 logo client would never even bother to call you. The first part of their conversation will be, I'm not sure I can afford you. And that's what a lot of clients call us and say, I'm not sure I can afford you. I've done my job. Now this sounds counterintuitive because you want all these leads. But if you like to chase leads of low paying clients that don't value your work, keep doing what you're doing, all right? And I'm not telling you guys this is the only way to do this. I'm telling you this is how I do it. If this works for you, if this resonates with who you are, try it, okay? Your site should be a barrier of entry, believe it or not, to low paying clients who do not value your work. The people who are offended by your price, they should not show up at your door. And every once in a while they get through and that's okay and you politely decline and move them on their way. Okay, so option three, you felt like you walked in with, I'm open, it could be expensive, but you're, not, you're like a real human being, you're not a jerk about it, right? Okay, and in the process of me talking to you about it, moving you from where you are to where I'd like you to be, how did you feel about that? I felt excited because really? I saw the potential for the, yeah, for the third option, that I saw the potential of where I am, which I'm just starting out, but then where I could be, and then you're, you're painting a picture for me uh. of what exactly you could provide for me or where my business could be or what my product could, right. could be perceived as. Okay, so here's what we're doing right now. I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing, okay? You came into this conversation from your world, from your point of view, and you have a certain expectation, you see it. Right. My job is to help you see the world through my eyes. And I have to paint a, a picture and tell a story about how to get there from point A to point B. So what I'm looking for is something in your life that I can relate to and I have many stories ready to go, okay? So if it's not about your car and when you said jewelry, you saw like I, I lit up, okay? And I was ready to talk about jewelry and the packaging and then I move you from step A to step B to step C and instead of us looking at each other, we're looking at the same problem in the same way. We're looking in the same direction, and that's very important. This is about storytelling, about helping you fill in all the gaps. You, you notice how like I describe things, like the way the door sounds when you close it, and maybe I can talk about the supple leather, the steering wheel, or the way that uh, the instrument panel, the cluster is designed. Now, how do I know these words? How am I be able to draw out these experiences? So you might be wondering, because I've never driven a five series or I've never driven X, Y, Z. How would you be able to talk about that? So the first thing you need to do, and I feel like this is true with a lot of people, not you specifically. I feel like a lot of people are just sleepwalking through life. They're not paying attention to anything. They're not looking at the way that the edge of this laptop is finished, how it's actually quite sharp. If you run your hand across it, you might cut yourself. They're not listening to the way that the door sounds when it closes. They're not watching the lighting of a movie when they're just sitting there enjoying it. They're not looking at the color temperature or whether or not the editor's cutting on action. So what we need to do is we need to, wake in, we need to wake up the sleeper and stop sleepwalking through life. We need to record all these experiences in our mind and take note of the things that are good and bad. We're gonna record this in the ledger of our mind, okay? So that when prompted, when necessary, you're able to dig these things out and tell them in a very natural way. You've got to pay attention. Okay, so if you hear something interesting, if you see something interesting, take a moment to record it. If it helps you to write it down because of your neuromotor skills or whatever it is, write it down. 
If it helps you to take a screen grab from it for with your iPhone or whatever smartphone you have, to grab it and review it every day. And you need to surround yourself with people who think and operate in a similar way because you'll keep each other sharp. An exercise that I have with my students is I play for them a main title sequence just one time. And the main title sequence of a film is about three minutes long. I play it and then I turn it off and I say, what did you guys learn? What did you see? Tell me everything. And we can see that with practice over time, the students are able to see more, remember more, and then to connect the threads. They can start to see what's in between the frames. What is the director's intent? What story are they trying to tell you? So if you can look at the world through those eyes, everything becomes your teacher. Everything becomes a classroom for you, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to paint this picture for you and I'm trying to find what is my entry point. It's everything. You notice how before we were talking about your clothes? And I'm just looking at you right now. I'm reacting to everything. The gold watch, the, the ring, all that kind of stuff. The way you do your hair, I'm pulling all those parts and I'm going to use them. Are you doing that? No, but I'll start. Okay. What do you need to do to start? Um, paying attention, writing things down, mm -hmm. just being aware of when I'm enjoying something, to ask myself, what is it specifically that I like about whatever it is, if it's a movie or music, just um, making note of my observations, kind of like how I do with my logo studies, to translate that into life, yeah. everyday life. Yeah. If something gives you joy, spend a moment to understand it and relive it. It will give you more joy. Right? If this mug has a certain feel and in your hands it feels wonderful, just, just be your fingertips for a little bit and feel the matte quality and then the glossy. Or the way that your sweater or your shirt feels against your skin. Or if you're greeted um, into like a really nice hotel and you open the door and there's a fragrance, spend time, like smell it. Just like close everything else down and record it in your mind because you'll be able to use those in stories later on. The details in the story really matter in painting the entire picture. It's not just visual, it's oral, it's your sense, the touch, the textures, and all that kind of stuff. You record all that. And guess what? When you go to design, when you go to pitch an idea to a client, you're able to speak about it in ways that you fill in those gaps, and it's a wonderful thing. Now, did I figure this all out by myself? No. I remember many, many years ago, probably year one or year two when we started the company, and I heard about how Kyle Cooper would describe a storyboard. He talked about the way the birds, the, the, the fluttering of their wings and the sound that would make and how it would cast a shadow onto the typography or how when somebody opened the door, the light would draw into the room and move up the furniture and around it. So we're revealing to the audience the scene one part at a time. And I, I remember that moment quite clearly and it was told to me by my friend and even hear it firsthand. And she was in awe of him talking about it. And I said to myself, I need to learn to speak about things in that same way. And so every point forward, anybody that was really good at describing things about telling the story, I paid attention and I made notes and I copied their language and their mannerisms, even how they paused, how they spoke faster in a moment to create excitement. I studied all those things. And that's how you begin to move into this road of being a good storyteller. I think when we're in a buying state of mind, you have to appeal to the left and the right brain or to the logic and the emotion. If you sell all logic and it's all bullet points and facts, uh, they'll make a decision, but there's no real pressing reason why they would do that. And if you appeal just to their emotion, they'll, they'll do an impulse thing and then they'll regret it later. So it's always a mixture and a balance of these two things. I learned this concept through a man named Jordan Belfort, who is the, the Wolf of Wall Street guy. In some of the videos that he talks about, he's like, you have to hit on both because without one or the other, it's a weaker case in, in a situation where you're trying to close a client. So I'm trying to bring in the emotional parts because it can overcome the rational parts of this is too expensive. You will pay for things that you feel emotionally connected to, things that are nostalgic. Nostalgic meaning makes you feel like home, homesick. You will pay for things that your, your rational brain can't sort out because they were able to tap or trigger something inside of you, okay? So that's what I'm trying to do when I'm describing these stories to you. Well, and also in, in your description and in talking to clients like that, 
even in that conversation alone, beyond taking them somewhere else and, and having them feel something, that that shows to me, well, if you put that much thought into a conversation with me and how, in describing what you're gonna do, how much more thought and intention are you gonna put into my actual That's right. product? That's so right. it's, it's showing something about who you are. The way that I win you over as a client is I want you to walk away thinking this person spends a lot of time thinking about things that I don't think about, but when they were brought up to me, this person's educating me in the entire process of an experience. I'd like to have the same experience for my clients, for my customers. Can yeah. you do this on a scale of one to 10? Can I implement this? Yes, and it will take practice. You want to practice right now on camera? Oof. I don't think I'm ready. Okay, that's fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back every once in a while and Melinda's going to give us a status update on the progress she's making on all the different things we've been talking about. Okay? And you'll keep a log of this and you guys can keep a log yourself. So if you do this right now with us in real time, you will see your life, your business, your mindset transform. Whether you're doing logo design, whether you're doing a website or shooting a video for somebody, try these principles. The first thing that you need to know is you need to start doubling your rate. You need to feel comfortable about that. And you need to bring in somebody with story. Talk to them. It's like you're the expert because you can talk about things in very detailed ways and activating all the other senses. Now we know the logo doesn't speak, doesn't make a sound, it doesn't have a, a texture per se, it doesn't have a scent. But I'm just doing a little theater of the mind so that you know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. All right, guys, I hope this episode was helpful for you and that you're enjoying this series. We plan on doing many more of these, so please give us a big thumbs up if you like the video and click on that subscribe button, which I don't even know where it is, and leave your comments below and we'll be sure to answer them. All right, thanks for tuning in, guys. See you next time.